All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. Edward Blum, you tried it. Now, before I get into my main subject, I want to read this article and then we're going to talk. This is coming out of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And mind you, this is just from a few hours ago, but by the time this video uploads, it might be about a day old, but still, it's relevant to everything we're talking about. Appeals Court pauses Atlanta Venture Capitalist Fund for Black Women. Conservative groups sued the Fearless Fund, alleging racial discrimination for helping black female founders. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta on Saturday ordered Atlanta-based venture capital firm Fearless Fund to pause grant applications supporting black female founders while a lawsuit alleging racial discrimination works its way through the court. The ruling is the first legal win for the nonprofit American Alliance for Equal Rights, a conservative group started by Edward Bloom, a key activist in the successful challenge of affirmative action in college admissions, the Alliance sued Fearless in early August, alleging their $20,000 small business grant program was racially discriminatory because it was only for black women. The grant application was supposed to close on Saturday, September 30th, but it must now remain open until further order of the court. No grant winner can be decided yet. On Tuesday, the Alliance and Fearless met in federal court for the first time, where lawyers for the Alliance asked U.S. District Court Judge Thomas Thrash Jr. to bar Fearless from enforcing the racial eligibility criteria for the grants. But Thrash denied the motion, saying the program sends a message that Fearless wants to support black women business owners and that message is protected free speech. In his written opinion, Thrash said the Alliance failed to carry its burden to clearly show a likelihood of success on the merits and irreparable harm. Later Tuesday, the Alliance filed an emergency motion with the 11th Circuit and a three-judge panel overturned Thrash's ruling. Two judges sided with the Alliance saying the plaintiffs have established an irreparable injury, calling the grant program racially exclusionary. One judge dissented, siding with Fearless. We respectfully disagree with this court's decision, appreciate the important points raised by the dissent, and look forward to further appellate review. We remain committed to defending the meaningful work of our clients. Alfonso David, president and CEO of the Black Global Economic Forum and one of the lead lawyers for Phyllis said in a statement. Similar conservative organizations have also targeted major corporations like McDonald's, Target, and Progressive, moves that are widely seen as an attack on affirmative action programs and business. But some venture capitalists who invest in black founders are now doubling down on their work. Jewel Burke Solomon is a co-founder and managing partner at Collab Capital an Atlanta-based venture capitalist firm that invests solely in black-led companies. This week at the Intentionally Good Summit, a gathering for diverse founders that was held inside of the Venture Atlanta conference, Burke Solomon was defiant when talking about the recent spate of lawsuits. It would not be true to why we started, why we got in this business if we made any tweaks or adjustments out of fear, Burke Solomon said during a panel discussion. The mission has to stay the same, and how we communicate around it, how we collaborate around it, should also stay consistent. So let's put some things into perspective here. When we're talking about the idea of venture capitalism, this is when you have larger investors or larger companies that decide that they're going to invest their money into a smaller company that's up and coming so that that company can grow into something larger. It's kind of like what you see when you watch the show Shark Tank, where you have these people who have started their businesses and they've been doing okay in their own yin 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 kind of way around the neighborhood, but they want to go bigger because again, when if, you, if you can get the right money behind you, you can go from mom and pop to industry, you know, getting into a space where eventually maybe you become a publicly traded company and you have all kinds of stakeholders and investors and there's lots of money to go around. But a lot of times people need that seed money to just get them to that to that next level of success. And so that's kind of like what you see on the Shark Tank. People go there and they have, I don't know, they're selling the magic pillow or they're selling diet water or whatever it is. And they talk to the different sharks and eventually somebody's either going to support them or they all tell that person to go home and try again. That's pretty much the idea of venture capitalism. Now let's talk numbers. When you're talking about businesses that are owned by black women, the amount of support that they get from venture capitalist companies in regard to revenue, they receive 0.0006% of all venture capitalist funding. I'm going to say that one more time. 0.0006%. That's how much they're getting. I'm going to say it one more time because I think it needs to really sink in so we can just really see how tit for tat this lawsuit is. 0.0006%. Not even 1%, right? And so 
there was a group called Fearless. And, and this is a group that's founded by a bunch of people, including Keisha Napoleon from The Cosby Show. And they pretty much decided, hey, we see a problem that's existing within our collective and we want to support those who are trying to get to that next level. Now, we're not the wealthiest people around here, but, you know, we can do the best that we can. So we're going to have this grant application program. And when you apply, you know, we will support you with upwards of $20,000 for your business. All right now with the work that they've been able to do they've been able to take that point zero 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 six figure and bring it up to point three nine still just point three nine of a percent but you know what it's better than point zero 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 six percent and what's so crazy is again people love to tell black folks pull yourself up by the bootstrap and it's so crazy because the goalpost moves every time you tell us to pull ourselves up by the bootstrap you take the boot you take the strap and take everything else folks still find a way to try to get some kind of gain and and create some kind of leverage within their own respective collective and he has snatched that too imagine being pissed off about twenty thousand dollars now i'm not trying to sound like i'm super rich or anything but in the business world twenty thousand dollars is not a lot of money okay they're doing the best that they can but even that is too much for somebody like an edward bloom to see black people get twenty thousand dollars to me that that's like a when you're talking to big companies that got the real money that's like a fifth of the budget for the christmas party that's just the open bar all right in, in, in real talk that's barely enough for your freshman year at undergrad depending on where you go and so this is such a silly lawsuit because it's almost like trying to sue for the water that splashes out of the pool like that's how petty this is but again it goes back to what i've been saying on this channel for a really long time where you have a lot of people who are working to cement things into place. You have a lot of people who want to ensure that the status quo is maintained. When we're talking about the status quo, you're talking about a system of anti-blackness backed by white supremacy and pushed through policy and law. And so that's what we're continuing to see all the time. So this leads us to pretty much the main person of this video, Edward Bloom. All right? So when we get to Edward Bloom, let's have this wonderful discussion, shall we? By the way, for those who follow me, if you've been watching all my lives, this is a rehash, to be honest. The last four or five videos, we've talked about Edward Bloom just because there's been so many cases in litigation. So for those who sit through my super long two or three hour lives where we talk about 10 or 15 different subjects, you're welcome to stay, but this is kind of like a rehash. You guys have already had perfect attendance in class, so if you want, want to check out of this one, that's perfectly fine. But for those of you who just got here, we're about to go down this rabbit hole. So again, what you're seeing is what I like to call punitive entitlement. This is when you have people who don't get their way, and because of that, they want everybody else to suffer. And they have a vengeance, and they continue to move on that vengeance. But somebody like an Edward Bloom is still pissed off. He will not let things go. This is kind of like when... A kid that's not really great doesn't make the football team and then rather than working on his craft and trying to get better for the next year of auditions or trials instead his parents just sue the school but not only do they not you know not only do they sue the school they say we're gonna take it to a bigger level they go all the way to the state level and they get all the way to the state Supreme Court where they want to push legislation that's gonna restructure the entire trial process for all football teams in the entire state that's the way that punitive entitlement moves at least in my opinion so now we get to Edward Bloom Edward Bloom has had a vendetta against black folks forever and a day, and it's so crazy because, again, if you look at all of the lawsuits that he's been a part of, they always have something to do with black folks getting a piece of something. When in reality, black folks, we already collectively don't have a lot when it comes to what's supporting us through policy, right? And so let's just go back in time, right? 1992. Edward Bloom decides to run for District 18 in Texas. Now, this is the area around Houston. And the reason he ran was because he saw that Craig Anthony Washington was running unopposed. He was an incumbent, or incumbent you know, congressman. And so he decided, well, I'm going to run. Now, mind you, he wasn't from the area as far as Edward Bloom. He had moved to the area because he was a stockbroker. And then he decided, well, I want to run for office because, hey, they only have one person running. I'm going to run, too. And so he runs. He loses. Right. He only gets 32 percent of the vote. And so he decides that, you know, this whole system is rigged. He wants to sue. And the reason that he decides to sue is he says that the district that he ran in is, is heavily gerrymandered by race, which is technically true. But what's so funny is people always go after the end result and never really address the origin. When you want to talk about that specific district, especially in 1992, um, as far as District 18, the reason the district was gerrymandered in the way that it was goes back to redlining. 
Now, we've talked about redlining a million times, so I'm not going to sit here and rehash it. But again, redlining pretty much was a practice that became extremely popular after the 1930s as a result of the success of different covenants and ordinances that started in 1910 back in Baltimore, where they decided that black people were only going to be allowed to live in certain regions of town. Fast forward to the 1930s, we get the FHA, Federal Housing Association or Authority or whatever they were called, and pretty much they're going to decide who they're going to lend you know, to in regards to mortgages based on where people live, based on what people look like. You have a system of colors, red, yellow, blue, and green. Red is pretty much where all the black folks live. And long story short, redlining created a space where even if you had the money to live in certain areas, you weren't allowed to, as a black person, you were only allowed to live in the red areas. And so because of that, the layout of District 18 literally mirrors, and I'm going to have the visuals up here, literally mirror the redlining map as in regard to what happens with the district. So rather than being mad about the fact that, hey, for a few generations, black people were only allowed to live in certain segments of Houston, and that created a space where now you have different political, you know, drive and ambition based on how people vote or how people look at their politics. You know, it's all centered around the idea of race because, hey, those in charge created a map specifically on people's race and locked people into that. You want to be mad and all of a sudden now you want to sue. You were quiet about the redlining, but now because you've lost your election because black people didn't vote for you, now you have a vendetta. And he pretty much in his argument said, you know, well, because these people aren't going to vote for me and this district is just is totally, you know, biased against people like me, so on and so forth. And it actually makes it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1996 in a case called Bush v. Vera. And as a matter of fact, he actually wins the case, right? And so by him winning the case, it gives him adrenaline. It gives him motivation. It's like, oh yeah, we're, we're about to keep it going. Now Now he's, you know, there's some momentum, that element of just getting a, a little a glimpse or a grasp of power. You know, some people love the idea of power because I'm going to be honest, he does not, in my opinion, seem like somebody who ran for office because he wanted to better the people of District 18. To me, he seems like somebody who ran for office because, again, that idea of power, that idea of being able to implement things that last long term and have your name attached to it and also can line your pockets. And so, yes, now he has the momentum. So it doesn't stop with him losing the election in 92 because he was looking at it like, oh, so y'all y'all didn't want to vote for me, huh? Y'all going to learn today. So let's talk about how we had to learn afterwards. So after he wins in 1996 in the Supreme Court, Edward Bloom is kind of like, you know what? That was pretty easy. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, there's some other things I'm mad about. And another thing. And it was crazy because it seems like everything he was mad about always had something to do with black folks. Always had some kind of correlation and some kind of policy that would try to remedy the wrongs that worked against black people collectively. But he had a problem with that. And so he would jump into over two dozen different lawsuits. And what's so crazy is he would often use other people to be the face of whatever it was he was fighting against. He would convince other people or get other people to say, hey, you know, because of this, this is affecting you too, so you need to get in on this. It's kind of like when you see the commercials for the class action lawsuits and they're looking for additional plaintiffs. So it's like, oh, were you in the mall in 1963 when the ceiling collapsed and somebody watching over in Billings, Montana is like, hey, yeah, I was in that mall. As a matter of fact, the ceiling tower fell and messed up my shoulder. I can't even play golf the way I used to. I'm going to join that suit. And so you get all these people who joined the suit. And the thing about when you have these larger lawsuits, you have a better probability of it making it to the Supreme Court after it's going through the rounds and through the appellate court and everything like that. Understand, the Supreme Court does not see every case. And so you're in this big giant pool of other people who are all fighting and clawing, trying to get to that top-notch Supreme Court level because, again, once the Supreme Court makes a ruling, it's the law of the land. And so when you can have a case with a bunch of plaintiffs and there's a whole lot of money that's leveraged in the conversation, then yeah, you have a higher probability of being put on the docket with in the Supreme Court. And so that's kind of been his move for the last 30 years, jumping into all of these different cases. And so one of the cases I want to jump into, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll go through a few. One was the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District number one versus Holder. Now, this correlates back to when we talk about the Voting Rights Act, right? So we got to backtrack. We go back to the, the Voting Rights Act. The reason we had to have the Voting Rights Act was because, again, you had a bunch of different states that were just tied to a bunch of shenanigans when it came to making sure that black people couldn't vote, right? A lot of the states were in the South or the Midwest, but they had things like, you know, a poll tax, or you had to take a literacy test, or they wanted you to count jelly beans, or they would do all these different things, or they would have these random spontaneous hours for the polling stations and make sure that, you know, the polling stations close at 2 p.m., knowing that nobody gets off of work till 5, just doing all of these different things to ensure that black people could not vote. And so, so this specific lawsuit targets Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. I want to read a piece of what Section 4 is about just to put things into context, all right? Section 4A of the Act established a formula to identify those areas and provide for more stringent remedies when appropriate. 
The first of these targeted remedies was a five-year suspension of a test or device, such as literacy tests, as a prerequisite to register to vote. So again, because you had about a dozen states that were acting like they didn't have any home training in regard to their practices when it came to voter rights, the federal government had to step in and say, okay, you know what? Y'all are doing a lot, and clearly this is unconstitutional, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to kind of monitor how y'all do things to ensure that you guys are not breaking the law and that no citizens' rights are being violated. So, you know, this is this law and this bill that we're going to put out there to make sure that you guys are following these rules. And so this is where Edward Bloom comes in because he had beef with Section 4A of that Voting Rights Act where, again, there's that five-year ban on oppressive tactics when it comes to voting. And so he's like, you know what? I found this district in Texas that's great. They don't have those problems with race. And as a matter of fact, I think Section 4A of, you know, the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional because it's like a blanket statement for the entire state. The entire state doesn't have those kind of problems with race because we've moved on. We're post-racial. You know, we are a melting pot. We are a collective of just great Americans who are all happy. And so, yeah, I think that's unfair. And you can't blanket statement an entire state. So I think districts should be able to opt out of Section 4A. Because not all of these districts have the same problems that once existed way back in the day. And so it makes it to the Supreme Court. And again, Edward Bloom and crew would win in the Supreme Court by a ruling of 8 to 1. Now, really, it was a ruling of about 9 to 0 because, to be honest, Clarence Thomas was the only one that dissented. But he technically agreed with the idea of allowing states to opt out of Section 4A of the Voting Rights Act. His beef was the fact that he felt that the Supreme Court should have discussed the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act declares that states and localities with a history of racial discrimination need to get permission from the federal government to enact any changes to their voting laws. And so Clarence Thomas is kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm down with y'all getting rid of 4A, but this Section 5, we can get rid of this too because racism doesn't exist anymore. Barack Obama's in office. You know, everything is all great. And look at me, I'm on the Supreme Court over here gutting all the rights for black folks. So, of course, you know, we can let that one go too. So that was the only reason he dissented. But that leads us to the next case that Edward Bloom would, would bring to the Supreme Court. And that would be Shelby v. Holder. Now, this would be the case that would eventually gut Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, not to be confused with Section 4A. Just to sum things up, Section 4B was known as the coverage formula, prescribing which states and jurisdictions with a history of discrimination were required to obtain pre-clearance under Section 5 before implementing a change to a voting law or practice. And so again, Section 4B is gutted, and again, Clarence Thomas is pressed. He's still pissed off. So even with him supporting Section 4B, he's still making the argument about the constitutionality of Section 5. He's like, get rid of that too. We can get rid of 4A and 4B. 5 definitely need to go, because like I said, everything is all good. There's no racism in America. Look at me and my wife. And so, you know, we get to that point, and ever since 2013, this is why we've seen the extremities in regard to what has been taking place in U.S. elections when it comes to all of these crazy new outlandish rules that have been created, where, you know, they've chopped down on polling hours, they've chopped down and tried to outlaw things like souls to the polls on Sundays, and all these different things. You know, in the state of Georgia, they were trying to make it illegal to give people a bottle of water in the line. Now, something like that was actually gutted and, and that, that lost in court. You know, we're now in a space where even when you get to places like Wisconsin and some other states, you're seeing them try to restructure the entire election where there's some states that now have rules where if they don't like the outcome of the election or they suspect there's voter fraud, they can just gut the whole thing and certify the election to be whatever they want it to be. Like that, That's kind of where we're at because, again, there are now no protections in regard to a lot of the voting rights and the voter law, so it's just kind of anything goes. That brings us to another case that would find its way before the Supreme Court, spearheaded by Edward Bloom. That would be Evenwell versus Abbott in 2016. Now, this was a case more so in response to the ruling of Gray versus Sanders in 1963. In 1963, that ruling would specify the idea of one person, one vote when drawing congressional districts. Each congressional district is to be as equal in population to all other congressional districts in the state as practicable. The boundaries and numbers shown for the congressional districts are those specified in the state laws or court orders establishing the districts within each state. And so again, when it comes to drawing congressional districts, the idea is to have the district drawn by the amount of people in the district. Edward Bloom decided, oh, I don't like that idea. I think we should have the districts drawn and counted based on the amount of eligible voters. Now, the problem with that is when you're talking about drawing congressional districts, it's a conversation of resources and allocation because, again, this is going to be what determines how much is going to go to freeways, how much is going to go to hospitals, schools, 
water treatment plants, even the electric grid. This this would determine, you know, are we going to really spend the money to keep the, the, the electrical lines uh, above ground or are we going to put them underground so the power doesn't go out every single time a tree falls? You know, those kind of things. And so it's a conversation of an allocation of resources. And so by only making it a space where you only count the eligible voters, now you're going to have a discrepancy between wealthy and, and poor as well, in addition to the fact that not everybody is eligible to vote. Think of the different populations that cannot vote. One, children, right? And so when you really get into a lot of these really big metropolitan areas, a lot of times the population is younger as far as the average population of the area because there are a lot of children. By taking children out of the equation when you're counting how many people are in a district in regard to resources, there's going to be a lot of cuts. There's going to be a lot of people who are left out. There are going to be a lot of people who don't receive the same amount as opposed to a district that might be much older in regard to average age and may also have more eligible voters. They're going to get a larger piece of the pie. In addition to that, we have to talk about the judicial system and the fact that there are a lot of people who have lost their right to vote. And when you talk about how the judicial system in the prison industrial complex has disproportionately affected black people, that leaves a lot of black people out of the conversation when it comes to eligibility in voting, right? And then in addition to that, no matter where you stand on the conversation, of immigration that would also leave out people who are undocumented and again this is a conversation about who you're counting in di in the district when you're talking about resources you want every single person in that district counted to ensure that the resources that come to your district are adequate and enough to supply and ensure that everybody is taken care of again when it comes to hospitals how many you know how much is going to be invested into grocery stores in the area well how much is going to be invested into libraries and any kind of public resource that everybody uses all of that is a conversation of resources and so by only allocating things to just eligible voters that creates a space where a minority population makes the rules for everybody else because also understand voting in America Americans don't vote anyway to be honest as far as percentage wise this is not a, a high performing voting country there are some districts where the voting rate is only 10 or 11 percent depending on where you live and recognize that 10 or 11 percent usually is the elite demographic within that voting district so again this was another idea but in this case he actually lost so that was thrown out but it didn't matter because he had other things going because in the same year there was Fisher versus the University of Texas. Now we've revisited this one as well. This is another one where again he, he had right and so this was an affirmative action case. This is from 2016 as well. Now you had Abby Fisher who again she was pissed off because she didn't get into her school and she was convinced that it was because black people were in her seat. I'm gonna go to the text before I go any further. In 2008, the year Fisher sent in her application, competition to get into the crown jewel of the Texas University system was stiff. Students entering through the university's top 10 program, a mechanism that granted automatic admission to any teen who graduated in the upper 10% of his or her high school class, claimed 92% of in-state spots. Fisher said in news reports that she hoped for the day universities selected students solely based on their merit and if they worked hard for it. But Fisher failed to graduate in the top 10% of her class, meaning she had to compete for the limited number of spaces up for grabs. She and other applicants who did not make the cut were evaluated based on two scores, one allotted points for grades and test scores. The other called for a personal achievement index, awarded points for two required essays, leadership, activities, service, and special circumstances. Those included socioeconomic status of the student or the student's school, coming from a home with a single parent or one where English wasn't spoken, and race. Those two scores combined determined admission. Even among those students, Fisher did not particularly stand out. Court records show her grade point average of a 3.59 and SAT scores of 1180 out of 1600 were good but not great for the highly selective flagship university. The school's rejection rate that year for the remaining 841 openings was higher than the turndown rate for students trying to get into Harvard. As a result, university officials claim in court filings that even if Fisher received points for her race and every other personal achievement factor, the letter she received in the mail would have still said no. It is true that the university, for whatever reason, offered provisional admission to some students with lower test scores and grades than Fisher. Five of those students were black or Latino. 42 were white. Neither Fisher nor Bloom mentioned those 42 applicants in the interviews, nor did they acknowledge the 168 black and Latino students with grades as good or better than Fisher's who were also denied entry into the university that year. Also left unsaid is the fact that Fisher turned down a standard UT offer under which she could have gone to the university her sophomore year if she earned a 3.2 GPA at another Texas university school in her freshman year.
So again, that punitive entitlement I was talking about, Abby didn't get her way, so everybody has to suffer. Abby was willing to go to the Supreme Court and gut an entire system that was aimed to remedy the flaws and the faults of the United States in regard to what has happened to black people when it comes to education. But because she did not get into a program that she did not qualify for in regards to getting that guaranteed admission as far as being top 10% of her class, you know, she said, I'm just going to take the whole system down. This is what we're talking about. And again, Edward Bloom got behind it and pushed it through. But unfortunately for them, they lost in the Supreme Court. But again, Edward Bloom never stops. He said, I'll just find somebody else to go to court with and we're going to keep going until we get it. So understand, recognize a lot of times, especially when you're talking about white folks, when you're talking about white folks that don't get their way and they have rage, oh, they're always going to find a way to get their way through policy. All right. Punitive policy, punitive entitlement, cousins. In addition to that, like I've said, he has all of these different groups and stuff. So he's also president of the Alliance of Fair Board Recruitment. Now, pretty much, this is another group that has a bunch of bits and pieces in litigation right now with the court system because their goal is to pretty much fight any kind of policy that requires that companies that are publicly traded have a diverse board of directors. Meaning, you know, that idea of diversity. We're going to cut all that. Y'all, that shouldn't be a requirement. Companies should just be able to do what they want. So they're suing for that. They're also suing the state of California in regard to the conversation of quotas based on race and gender, when in reality, that's already been outlawed in California since 1978. But they're going tit for tat and finding any kind of policy that they think falls under the idea of a race quota or a gender quota, and they're suing against that too. And so just recognize you're seeing the nonsense that exists, but it doesn't stop there because then we get to modern times where you have, again, another group he's behind, the SFA, Students for Fair Admission. This is how we just saw affirmative action get gutted with that whole conversation around what was happening over at Harvard University. Now, they initially tried to, to sue in 2019. It got dismissed. And so they brought some more plaintiffs on and then also included UNC within this lawsuit. And then that's what ended up getting to the Supreme Court. That's what ended up getting gutted. And so now we're starting to see the outcome. By that ruling, you're watching a lot of schools all across the country jump right in the cold right away and start shifting how they're going to do their admissions. You're watching all kinds of diversity programs start to be altered and cut and shifted around and so on and so forth. Because again, Edward Bloom, like I said, he's never going to stop. And he's already said that he's going to continue to fight for all of the injustices against everybody else. Because apparently the lawsuit that took place in 2023 in regard to, you know, the SFA, it was trying to state that places like Harvard and UNC were discriminatory against Asian students. And so somehow black people, it was our fault. So, you know, again, black people ended up being collateral. Cause like I said, we be minding our business and folks got all the smoke in the world for us. Like I said, we're in a space where like black folks can't even have nothing. And even when black folks don't have nothing, they want to take that. Cause folks are like, oh no, you're not going to have more nothing than us. We want that too. And so that's literally what we're seeing. And like I've said before, when it comes to race, nothing is precedent, which is why I always tell people like this is not the time to tap out politically. It's not the time to just say, well, the heck with it. I don't care no more. Only because, again, you have people like an Edward Bloom and others who are cementing things and ensuring that, you know, the way that they want things to be is going to become the way of, of everything. It's going to be the standard. It's going to not just be the law, but cemented. Look at what's happening even in regard to, again, when we talked about what shifted with Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act. You're now seeing positions that were once voted on be shifted to positions that are appointed by people that were already, you know, they already scammed their way up in there, and now they're restructuring certain positions and making them so they're only appointed. Who do you think they get appointed by? They get appointed by the same people that do the nonsense, and then you appoint them and give them lifelong positions. And so again, things get cemented. So this brings us back to Fearless, where again, you have a group of people who say, hey, there's all these black businesses. There's all these black businesses by black women that, you know, they're really just trying to get a leg up. Let's, let's just try to give them a piece of something if we can help them. And somehow that is discriminatory against Asians and white people, because that's the argument that he made in regard to the lawsuit against Fearless. And so you are seeing the nonsense. Now, I won't spend all night on my soapbox because I want to go to sleep, but I want people to pay attention to the logistics. What we're dealing with today stems back to the fact that somebody lost an election in 1992. Like, really just sit with that. You know, you, you lose an election in 1992, and your argument is, well, this was a gerrymandered district. Everybody in the district was black, and they voted against me. So rather than making the argument that, hey, maybe you just didn't connect with the voters, you want to attack the fact that the district is gerrymandered. And listen, I always have my smoke about gerrymandering, but in this specific context, when you're talking about that gerrymandered district of number 18 in 1992, in Texas, it was gerrymandered because of redlining. 
the end result of discriminatory practices against black people collectively. You had no smoke for the red line. You had no smoke for the nonsense that's been happening to the black people in that region. But now you want to be pissed off because of the end result of what happened to them. Shift the narrative, turn the tables, turn yourself to be the victim in all of it and center it about you and your feelings because you can connect with the voters. And so fast forward, it gets to the Supreme Court. You win. And now we fast forward to 2023 and you're pissed off because folks are getting pockets of $20,000 for their businesses. Be pissed off because they're getting 0.039% of venture capitalist funding. This is what I'm talking about when I say that there are people who are working to submit to ensure that they get the kind of America that they want for themselves and their collective at the expense of everybody else, right? Everybody else's collateral. So just take note. And this is why I also said earlier, again, even when it comes to, you know, folks who decide to create movements or anything that supports black people collectively, you're going to have to start paying attention to the language that you use in regard to how you present your stuff. Because again, he's not going to be the only one. As more people see that, oh, we can just kind of go tit for tat and jump into loopholes and take it all the way to the Supreme Court. That's what we're going to get to. Look at what's happening with the books. When you talk about all these book bans and everything else that's happening, that's, that's 11 people, 11 women felt some kind of way. 11 white women pissed off about whatever. And, and look what's happening with the, with the education system and look at what's happening with libraries and books, right? 11 people. So like I said, like I think even with that, the language would have to shift. It can't just be because we're black, this is what happened. It's going to have to show and, you know, pretty much it's going to have to show cause and effect. It's going to have to show that there is a hurt, there is an offense, and because of that hurt and an offense, this is what happened, which is why you're going to have to start backing everything by policy. And that's the one thing that does work in the favor of black people when talking about a claim that they have against the United States. Because the United States was so terrible, everything is backed by policy. So when you talk about housing discrimination, you can just go look up all the covenants that existed in all the cities, whether it be Baltimore, whether it be D.C., whether it be Atlanta, whether it be Chicago, whether it be New York, whether it be De uh, Detroit or St. Louis or New Orleans, like Houston, Dallas, Austin, L.A., Seattle, Portland, Boston. We could be here all day. All of these cities have covenants that show the old maps of what happened with redlining, okay? And this is kind of one of the reasons why, again, that conversation of cause and effect. You're going to have to back your claim through policy. Now, I do think in a court system with, you know, fearless, God willing, they got some great lawyers and they can kind of push the narrative and highlight the fact that, hey, again, this is a group that's trying to remedy the fact that black women are practically getting nothing in regard to the conversation of venture capitalism. Same thing with black businesses. They're not getting anything, right? And so it's just weird because for some reason people have an obsession with everything that black people have. We're the only demographic that everybody bothers, like in regard to taking away stuff. Think of, and this is not to go after other groups of people, but think about like in most metropolitan cities. Other different groups and ethnicities and nationalities have their own segments of town, have their own businesses. I know when I go to my home state of Washington, I know I can go down South Tacoma Way and there's going to be a strip where everything is tailored to those from the Southeast Asian community. Lovely for them. You know, they got everything in the signs that's in Vietnamese or Korean specifically for their collective. And you know what? People are like, cool, that's for them. That's their stuff. So be it. Same thing you go to, you know, you go to Columbia Heights in D.C., there's a whole segment where everything is really for those, you know, in the Hispanic and Latino community. So, you know, Ecuadorian shops and, and shops for people that are from Nicaragua and Mexico and, and Panama and everything like that. And some of the signs in the restaurants are only in Spanish and the businesses are only in Spanish. And folks are like, OK, cool. That's for them. However, for some reason, black folks get a piece of anything. Everybody thinks it's supposed to be theirs, which is just something I, it, it baffles me. Just interesting. So, again. I just think that conversation of language has to start shifting in regard to a lot of the things that, you know, we get behind in regards to initiatives. Like I said on one of the lives, this is one of the reasons why black farmers lost in 1999 when they sued the federal government in regard to discriminatory practices, because their argument was y'all did this to us because we were black, but they needed to show hurt by policy. And so what should have happened, which again, I think actually I won't even talk about what should have happened, but I will say this in modern times, we saw the Biden administration put out the legislation where they decided they wanted to allocate allocate $4.5 billion to disenfranchised farmers. Because again, you can't line item anything to say black and white unless it's reparations for certain groups of people that have been wronged by the country, which is like, all right, well then where's black people's money at? But anyway, getting to the farmer's bit, and I'm a wrap because I'm starting to go into a totally different direction. But Again, $4.5 billion for disenfranchised farmers. The majority of those farmers were black farmers. It's a conversation of the fact that black farmers were left out of the USDA program. It's a conversation of heirs land. I'm not going to jump into it, but I have a few videos on it. So just type in Calvin Michaels, black farmers. It will answer everything I'm talking about. But recognize that just as soon as that, that money was allocated to disenfranchised farmers, again, majority black farmers, guess who showed up pissed off? White farmers. They said, oh, no, wait a minute. Y'all not getting no $4.5 because we, we should get that, too. 
Mind you, they already got a settlement and a bailout from the Trump administration because when the Trump administration decided to jump into all of the tariff wars with China, American farmers were getting their behinds kicked. And so they had to bail out American farmers, but it was only farmers that qualified as USDA farms. And a lot of black farms do not qualify as USDA farms for a conversation again with heirs land and titles. That's a whole nother conversation. We ain't going there tonight. And so white farmers already got their bailout. They got their check. Black farmers didn't even get that piece on top of the fact that they were already disenfranchised from everything that's been happening. And it's a conversation of the fact that black people have lost 14 million acres of land. You know, during the 20th century, we could be here all day. But anyway, white farmers sued and said, oh, no, they're not getting their money. So then the black farmers didn't get their money. They got pissed off. Now they're suing the Biden administration like, hey, we need our money. And it's a mess. So, again, like I said, anytime black people get a piece of something, somebody mad. A mess. Anyway. I'm out, share your two cents. We'll see how this unfolds. Again, this is going to a higher court, so we will see where this goes. Um, I'll be honest, though, I, I, I don't know, because Edward Bloom, is, he, he's racking them up with the nonsense. But yeah, just understand, there's a whole lot of haters out here ready to snatch up everything you got. And they're not just, it's the HBCUs, y'all y'all are next. So, hey, HBCUs, be, <sighs> I'm going to go to bed. Anyway, share your two cents, I'm out, subscribe.